years ago Now with the Spirit Now I'm a Savior I was filled Not filled Oh, in that old Fashion meeting Hello, my name is Holly, and welcome back to the Murder She Shit, and I am excited to be back as well, although I had the most amazing trip of my life in Canada. Canada is beautiful, and the Canadian people are some of the friendliest people I have ever met. So, if you are Canadian out there, you are pretty awesome. But I was glad to be back with my three dogs, and they were so excited to see me. Actually, Simon's just laying right outside the doors. Here we go. I'm going to talk about a serial killer today. This is a true crime vintage case about a serial killer, rapist, and necrophile, Earl Leonard Nelson. Nickname, The Gorilla Man. I have thoroughly researched this case. Had plenty of time driving. Hopefully this is a case that you haven't heard before, but if it is, maybe I can cover some facts that you have not heard. Before we begin, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button so you can keep up with all of my unique crime cases. So sit back, relax, maybe get a snack, and just pretend you are sitting in my she shed. It truly is the most peaceful place in the world. And I'm glad to be get back home. Here we go. Earl Nelson was born on May 12, 1897 in San Francisco, California to parents James Farrell and Fanny Nelson. It was said that James, Earl's father, slept around and in doing so contracted syphilis, Yeeks. which he passed on to his wife, unfortunately. After giving birth to Earl, his mom began to run high fevers and at this point, his dad was not home often. His dad's mind was already demented from the effects of syphilis. James passed away in a ditch after trying to drink away the ill effects from his disease. Earl's mother Fanny was sick so much that she could not properly care for little Earl. Earl would be neglected to the point of being almost feral. His mother passed away laying Basically, spread eagle in the floor. Not sure about why all that. I didn't ask questions. I just read. But apparently, she was spread eagle when they found her. And Earl was not found till days later when the landlord broke the door down. After hearing the little boy's screams, he broke it down. When found, he was covered in feces and urine, and his mouth was so dry, his screams were more like whispers. His maternal grandmother, Jeannie Nelson, took him in even though she already had raised like five children of her own. Just two of her own were still young enough to be living at home though. His grandmother was a hardcore Bible-thumping Pentecostal lady that would beat the Bible right into you. She was not going to allow Earl to be like his mother. She felt she failed when it had come to Fanny. When Earl first arrived at her house, he had walked around practically like a gorilla. He would walk around the house on his hands and pick things up in his mouth. He had to be taught how to use utensils because at first he would just slop all of his food together and pour olive oil over everything in his plate. And just grab it up like a horse, chomping on grass. And I was like, what's wrong with that? Olive oil's good. After starting the school, he would often quote scripture to the other children. He would give sermons to people no one else could even see. And would often preach about the beast. Revelations. At the age of seven, his teacher could stand no more and kicked him out of school. He would often 
end up getting beatings from his grandmother so she could keep him in line. Very strict woman. One of his grandmother's children gave him a bicycle, and it became his favorite hobby. He rode everywhere. He loved that bike. He was doing tricks and showing out for other children. Until one day, while showing out, he was ran over by a streetcar, and this had punched a hole through the temple of his head. Some of the children he had been showing off for had dragged him back to his grandmother's house. And when he arrived, he could not speak full words and had urinated himself. He then went into a coma for six days. Six days. From that day forward, he suffered from migraines, memory loss, fainting, and would often wet the bed, which he would receive lashes for. He would steal his grandmother's liquor in order to ease those headaches. He began to also compulsively play with himself and he started peeping in on his aunt while she was getting ready to go to bed you're gonna find out he just really has this thing for his aunt he's kind of obsessed with her so his grandmother swore that when he had knocked that hole in his head a demon had crawled right on in Grandmother Jenny began to notice her own door would be cracked when she would get up in the morning. And she knew that that little beast must have been trying to spy on her during her state of undress. So she started locking her doors. This is what would lead to the grandmother's death because one day she slipped in the bathtub and could not get up by herself, but refused to call out for help because she did not want Earl to see her like that, naked. Yeah, she literally died from pneumonia. The aunt he had spied on, his grandmother's daughter, felt sorry for Earl. So when Earl was 14 years old, she took him into her house to care for him. He would often just wander the streets in the evening, not coming home some nights. He would end up just sleeping in like an abandoned cabin or the woods. And he would often be heard reciting the book of Revelations over and over again. Earl lost his virginity to a prostitute and continued to sleep around and drink just like his father until he contracted a venereal disease too. And then the prostitutes refused to sleep with him. At the age of 18, he was thrown in prison for breaking into a cabin to sleep. But the family actually came home and found him in there. So he was sentenced to two years in San Quentin, where he was able to get treated for his venereal disease. So that was a great thing. Yeah. He would soon be arrested again for larceny. Now he was not only sleeping in houses, but stealing their belongings too. But he was able to dig his way out of the new prison. After this, he decided to sign up for the military. His bizarre behaviors were so bad that when he deserted after three days of military training, no one from the military chased him down because that is actually what they hoped that he would do. That's pretty bad. You must be pretty bad when the military don't come after you. He would then wander in and out of the military several times until the last time when he was locked in a mental facility. He would escape that mental facility and wander back to his aunt's house where he insisted on sleeping in the basement where it was dark. He liked to be in the dark because it eased his migraines and brought him comfort. And he could read his Bible. He would read Revelations over and over. He was obsessed with Revelation. His aunt was actually able to get him a job as a janitor at a hospital. And there he met a 50-year-old Spencer named Mary Martin, even though Mary was old enough to be Earl's mother. They were married in August of 1919. Mary was a Catholic and refused to sleep with him until marriage. But on the first night after they married, Earl treated her just like he had the prostitutes. He was rough and did to her anything he liked, and Mary was too ashamed to speak to anyone about it. 
On nights when Mary would refuse, he would lay beside her and openly, well, take care of himself. Yeah. Telling her that it was her fault since she didn't do what a wife was meant to do. Then one day, when working at the hospital, Earl was up on the ladder, just painting away, when he had another fainting spell and fell to the ground, hit his head, and ended up in a coma for three days. Stewed, as you notice, hits his head a lot. Well, that's a bad sign, considering a lot of serial killers do hit their head, and he's already hit it twice, so that's some bad serial killer luck. When he awoke, his wife would say that the man who had awoke from the coma was not the same man she had fell in love with. Then one day, Earl walked up to a house. When a young man answered, he said, I'm the plumber, here to take the buller out of your basement. This young man, Charles, and his 12-year-old sister, Mary, was at home just by themselves. Guess their parents were at work. So they just lay him in thinking it was something their parents had wanted done. Earl walked in, went straight to their basement. That is what he had came to do since he was having one of those bad migraines. So he walked down into the dark to get some maybe comfort. But suddenly, Mary wandered down into that basement. Unfortunately for her, she had heard someone talking down in the darkness and had not known her brother let this stranger into their house. As soon as Earl seen her, he knew he had to have beautiful Mary. Earl was a huge man. He had hands as big as the girl's head. Mary noticed he had a hair that stuck out the tops of his hands and chest and that he basically just walked like a gorilla. Mary turned and started to run back up the stairs when Earl grabbed her by the ankles and grabbed her off into the darkness. This man started grabbing at her in places no man had ever touched her before. He seemed like the boogeyman to her. She had so often feared as a little girl. Mary was able to get a scream out in which her brother, Charles, heard. He came to her rescue, kicking her and scratching him. Earl escaped, running as fast as he could, but authorities caught up with him and his mug shot. You can see in this picture all the scratches inflicted on him by Charles. So Charles really got him. To me, when I was researching this from the descriptions that was given, I felt like that Earl would have been super ugly. I just pictured this hairy gorilla man. And then when I seen his pictures, I was like, hey, he's not bad looking. There was a lot of pictures that he was actually quite handsome in. So I was shocked as how they describe him. It's not how I pictured him. Earl was released back into the mental facility that he had been in before. The same one that he had escaped out of. Earl realized how much that attempted R.A.P.E. had excited him. And he knew when he got out, he would try it again. But this time, he would not let the girl scream. While Earl was at the facility, his wife divorced him. Earl escaped once again, then on February 20th, 1926, he would make good on his promise. He came up on an apartment where he noticed that the landlord was a 60-year-old woman by the name of Clara Newman. She actually looks quite pretty for 60, I thought. He noticed she had a for rent sign posted in her window. When Clara opened the door, she seen a huge man holding a Bible, and he asked if he could look at the studio apartment because he just might be interested in renting the room. So as Clara was showing him the studio, he wrapped his massive hands around Clara's throat, and it excited him so much that he continued choking until she took her last breath. Earl remembered with his wife Mary choking her till she was unconscious and how much he had enjoyed the things he had done to her while she was unconscious. Earl then picked Clara up by her neck and carried her upstairs to a closet 
where he placed her body and then lifted her skirts and had his way with her already deceased body. The next time on March 2nd, he was prepared. He put on a new black suit, slicked his hair back, carried a Bible in a suitcase so he could have that preacher man image and walked up to the door of 63-year-old Laura Bell after she showed Earl the room for rent. He grabbed her and tackled her to the ground, tearing off a silk belt from her house coat and tied it around her throat. He pulled until blood ran down her throat. She was now a steel doll version of a living woman to use and pose how he saw fit. The next morning, he saw both murders in the paper and decided to hop a train and head back to San Francisco. He would not kill again until March 31st. Lillian, Mary, was 63 years old, and as he RAP'd her dead body, he quoted scriptures to justify his evils. In the paper, it became known as the Dark Strangler, and since one man had got a quick glance at him, had told the papers he looked and walked like a gorilla. He also became known as the Gorilla Killer. The papers also warned ladies not to show rooms to strangers. So, he skipped town to Santa Barbara, where the locals had not heard of the Gorilla Killer yet. This time, though, the Gorilla Killer would get caught in the act. Will Franey who was a boarder at Miss Ollie Russell's boarding house. He worked night, so he was coming home to sleep at the boarding house. And so, after sleeping for a few hours, he heard knocking, and he realized it was coming through the wall. Since it was usually quiet in the boarding house during the day, he thought this was a bit unusual. So, he wandered down the hallway to a room he thought did not have a tenant. So he peeped through the keyhole and he could see the bare leg of a lady's thigh and a stranger on top of her that was causing the banging of the headboard up against his wall. When he peeked through again, he recognized his landlord, Miss Ollie's dress. But he was completely shocked because she was a married woman. He ran back to his room and lay in bed. And he just laid there listening to the continued banging through that wall. Then he heard the man leave. And when he left, he knew he had to confront this married woman about her sin. He wiggled her door, but it was locked. So he peeked through the keyhole again, noticing that she was not moving and her throat was red. And then he seen what looked like blood. He ran to retrieve Miss Ollie's husband. And when they unlocked the door, Will realized he had been listening to a man assault a corpse. And he ran to the toilet to throw up his guts. He had not even seen what the man looked like, so his testimony was pretty useless to authorities. Four more women would be murdered in just a few weeks period. This is baby boy Simon. He missed mommy so much. He just couldn't wait till mommy got home and he wants mommy to hurry and get done with this video so she can get back to taking care of little Tommy. It's my baby boy and he's very spoiled. Each time Earl would become more violent and sadistic. When he showed up at the door of 35 year old Beta Withers, he decided she was not like the other older women that would try to control him. The grandmotherly figure who had punished him for his transgression. But as he spoke to her, he realized she favored his Aunt Lillian. The very first objects of his lust. He felt shame after he had murdered her and violated her. His aunt had been good to him. He carried her body up to the attic and put it in a trunk so he could hide her shame and the filthy things she had done. Not him. He then would murder a 23-year-old woman near Kansas City. Miss Harpin was violently assaulted and murdered. And then, when Earl went to leave, he heard a baby crying. He stopped in the hallway, violently 
heard the cry, and it back up to the baby's nursery, where baby Robert was laying in his crib. He remembered how he had cried for days after his mother was murdered, and he did not want this baby to suffer the same fate. He took off baby Robert's cloth diaper and then wrapped it around the baby's neck, slowly ending the baby's life. He would kill several other women before leaving Portland. All the pieces were coming together for the police, and they had managed to pretty much ID Earl Nelson as the gorilla killer. The newspapers quickly found out and published his name and face in every paper in the country. Soon, Earl's ex-wife and his aunt were being harassed by the reporters and people around them. Earl had already hopped a train and headed back to his home city of San Francisco, but authorities had decided he would not dare show his face there again. He killed in San Francisco and the next day went to the next town over where he encountered a heavily pregnant woman, Miss Murray who was only 25 years old, and as they began to choke her, she pleaded for the baby boy still in her womb. He began to see her as his own mother and himself as the baby, being raised by someone else when his mother had passed away. He released his grip and actually let her run away, the only one that would ever survive. She was able to give a good description of him. After killing 19 women in the U.S. and baby Robert, Earl decided it would be best if he left and went to Canada. Many of the women were hid under the bed after he was done with their corpse. Some of the women's skulls he beat on the ground and would knock their teeth out, or their bones were broken before he choked them. After Earl entered Canada, he rented another boarding house, but he did not murder for a while anyway. And he did murder the landlord this time. He wanted to keep a low profile. So he just settled down in Winnipeg. And one day, while walking the streets, he encountered a beautiful 14-year-old girl that reminded him of his aunt when she was a girl. And this is the most gruesome murder that he did. It's horrible to this 14-year-old girl. Lola Cohen's came from a poor family and would often sell items that her brother had made in the streets just to help support her family. Her father had been sick. Earl observed this and figured out a way to entice her by offering her money, but she would have to come back to his boarding house to actually collect the money. He did not immediately murder Lola. He wanted to savor her death. He choked her several times and brought her back. For his enjoyment. While she was unconscious, he took off her clothes and his. When she awoke, she started scratching him with her nails. This angered Earl, so he stuck his teeth under her fingernail and ripped it off her finger. He continued to do this while R.A. ping her until he had pulled off all ten of her fingernails. Then she continued to slap him. She fought fought and that may have been part of the problem because she was a fighter so then she continued to slap him so he broke her wrist joints both of them popped them then lola managed to squeeze her thighs together to stop the painful thrust and earl then snapped her thigh bones no other victim suffered like poor little lola did instead of choking her when he was done breaking almost every bone in her little body and abusing her. He then stuck her under the bed. She's still alive. Earl then kneeled at the side of the bed, said a prayer, and crawled upon the mattress to sleep. His large frame on the mattress crushed Lola underneath, causing her to suffocate. When he awoke from his nap, he then got her out from under the bed, abused her corpse, and then stuck her back under there. His final murder was Emily Patterson. Only Emily was beaten over the head several times by a hammer he had found in her boarding house. 
And he beat her several times over and over again, but she was not dead. So he then strangled her with his belt. When Mr. Patterson, Emily's husband, came home from work, he was instantly worried to not see his wife at the house. It was unusual. His neighbors helped him search the boarding house from top to bottom, and the police were notified. Around bedtime, he had no choice but to just feed and bathe his children and put them to bed. After going to his bedroom, he kneeled down beside his bed to pray for his missing wife to be found. His prayers were answered when he went to rise and his knee pulled the valance up on his bed and caught a glimpse of his wife's sweater. He then reached under the bed and grabbed her cold, dead hand. Be horrible. The next day, Earl went to the barber shop to get a haircut. While the barber was giving him a haircut, he noticed dried blood on Earl. He asked Earl about it and Earl stated for him just to mind his own business and after Earl had left the barber was able to describe Earl to a T. Authorities were then able to arrest Earl five miles from the U.S. border. He was put in jail but the officers did not know how great escape artist that Earl was and as soon as Earl was alone in the jail he was able to break free. Winnipeg authorities knew Earl would try to escape on the train that was headed into America. So they stopped the train and put officers on it. And then they were able to arrest Earl as he jumped into a train car. Earl stated to authorities, For a godly man like me, murder is impossible. Earl had tons of witnesses that could point the finger to him, so eventually Earl confessed to reporters. He cracked a smile and said, I only do my lady killings on a Friday night. So on January 30, 1928, he proclaimed his innocence before he was hung from the gallows, suffering the same final fate as he performed on his victims. Only his body was never abused and shamed unlike his victims. He would remain the most prolific serial killer in the U.S. until Dean Coral, the candy man, finally surpassed the body count. Somehow, the Dark Strangler has been mostly forgotten about, but perhaps he is the boogeyman in our nightmares. Maybe so. All right, I'm going to go do something with my dogs. They've been bored without me. My son was watching them, and I don't think he's walked them like I did. You know, he was good with them, but he don't do as much with them as I do, so I'm sure they got kind of bored. All right, y'all have a great and blessed and safe week. I love y'all. Thanks for joining me right here at my Murder She Shed. Come back on Suspense She Shed Sunday. Who knows? I might do one more before then. Who knows? All right, bye. Well, it was in my childhood day. Now with the spirit